So when velocity is collapsing, anyone or any company or any country with debt collapses and the collateral that still exists, a house, a car, a building, whatever it is, that goes into the hands of generally banks because that's who is on the other side of the loan. And then I wanna show what happens next. everyone and welcome to this video. I've got Alan Hibbard with me once again and Alan is going to be making a presentation to me. Alan, how are you doing? I'm great, Mike. Thanks. Good. In so you've got, so this is sort of a continuation of the great taking. And uh, in the book, he talks about velocity and you've put together a presentation for me. So uh, let's get into it and, and uh, see what you've got. Yeah, thanks. In this video, I really want to answer two questions. What is velocity of money and why does it matter for the average person? So the first thing I have here is an explanation from the great taking. Velocity is the number of times that a unit of currency is spent to buy goods and services in a period of time. Okay, so basically you can think of it as the number of times that the average dollar moves around the economy in a given year. Yeah, how many times it changes hands. Yeah, exactly. So it's a pretty simple concept, actually. Yeah. So the way we calculate it, okay, is by comparing the value of all goods and services produced in a period of time, GDP, okay, and then we divide that by essentially how many dollars exist. So the value of all cash and deposits, which could be used nearly as easily as cash. Okay. And, yeah. the, and the equation here is that velocity is equal to GDP divided by the money supply. Excellent. Awesome. So in order to understand it, I have a couple graphics here. Um, velocity of money can go up really in two different ways. Either when GDP goes up, velocity will go up. Or when the money supply goes down, velocity will go up. Okay, so that's... that's yes, because you've got... A, if, you, if your GDP is, is increasing and the currency supply is fixed, you have to use those dollars more often. Mm-hmm. If GDP is fixed, but the currency supply shrinks, the um, the difference. So you know the difference between currency and money. Back in in the uh, when we used gold, uh, it couldn't vanish. It didn't come out of anywhere, uh, and now we've got uh, uh, currency that can uh, instantly appear and disappear. So if the if if more of it when <clears throat> Uh, currency is com constantly springing into existence with a loan and then being extinguished. If people decide not to borrow and to create more loans tomorrow than we had yesterday, uh, then the currency supply can start to go into a collapse uh, because they're paying off debt. And when you pay off debt, you're extinguishing dollars that were borrowed into existence in the first place. And so the currency supply, if it shrinks, but GDP stays the same. There are fewer dollars that have to be used in this. We've got the same amount of transactions in a year, but fewer and fewer dollars to make those transactions. So each dollar has to be used more often, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. in just a minute, we're going to look at some charts of velocity so we can see if it goes up or down over time. But first, I just wanted to give everyone an intuition of what would cause it to go up or down. And again, velocity can fall when GDP falls. So that's not good. Or it can fall when the money supply grows too quickly. And we're going to see some examples of that in just a second. So and the GDP doesn't have to be fixed. Like in the uh, first example, uh, if GDP is growing quicker than the money supply, the money supply doesn't have to be fixed in that one. They can both be going up, but GDP going up faster. The next one, uh, they can both be falling, but the money, the currency supply uh, has to fall faster than GDP and velocity goes up. And then in the second, the red uh, scenarios, if GDP is falling uh, faster than the currency supply, uh, velocity goes down. And if the currency supply is growing faster than GDP, the velocity goes down. Exactly, exactly. And so a natural question that comes out of this is, okay, do, is it better for velocity to go up or down? Like, like which is better? And uh, well, let's try to answer that. So in a healthy economy, I would argue that GDP increases. Okay. I think we would kind of agree with that. And to your point, the point you made a second ago, usually at a faster rate than the money supply. 
So that means that the velocity of money slowly increases. So if the GDP grows faster than the money supply, velocity grows. That's generally a good right. thing. In a sick economy, GDP generally declines, although it doesn't have to, which means that velocity falls a little on its own. When GDP goes down, velocity goes down. But sometimes the money supply increases uh -huh. while GDP decreases. And the net effect is for velocity to collapse. Giant downward red arrow collapsing. Yeah. So in this case, GDP is moving down to cause velocity to go down and money supply moves up, which also causes velocity to go down. So it's it's like a double negative here. And yeah. by the way, if anyone wants to see this uh, in an animated format, they can check out Hidden Secrets of Money, Episode 7. Mike, you have a, a great presentation here where you explain this all in a visual. It's wonderful. And so why does this matter? Well, coming back to the great taking, collapse in the velocity of money is exactly what was unfolding from the 19th century and leading up to the Great War. Within a few years, the Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires ceased to exist. We have entire empires that ceased wow. to exist, as did the Qing dynasty. The German economy was destroyed. Then followed the Great Depression, then the Second World War, and the slow collapse of the British Empire. No populations were un unscathed. There were no winners. So this is why velocity matters. When a collapse in velocity of money happens, entire empires disappear off the map. It's, it's wow. a really big deal. So were there any that, uh, or were there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or were there? That's where I was going to next. There so were no there. winners or were there? Yeah, were there? Well, while there was widespread deprivation, selected banking interests took the collateral of thousands of banks, which were forced to close, as well as of the great many people and businesses, large and small, the indebted. So when velocity is collapsing, anyone or any company or any country with debt collapses and the collateral that still exists, a house, a car, a building, whatever it is, that goes into the hands of generally banks because that's who is on the other side of the loan. And this yeah. happened in Predator, right? Yeah, massive, massive quantities. So that's what happened back then. And I want to show what that looks like in a chart here. This is from the great taking it goes from 1900 and I, I chopped it off here at about 1995. I'll show you the rest of it in just a second. But you can see velocity of money is falling. It's collapsing until right. about the end of World War II and then it recovers again. So, Mike, when you look at this, what do you see? Uh, well, yes, I see that uh, collapse into the Great War and then, we, you know, World War One. And then from uh, 1913 to 1918, you see that huge spike in velocity. And uh, uh, that also uh, goes right along with the, uh, so I don't, this is the U.S. velocity. Um, <clears throat> that goes right along with the Federal Reserve, the inception of the Federal Reserve, and a bunch of printing uh, where they, the Federal Reserve Act didn't specify full backing by gold. It specified 40 percent backing by gold, which means for every $20 gold piece, they could now print $50. So they could they already had a $20 bill in circulation representing that gold piece. But now they could put another 20 and a 10 in circulation that came out of nowhere. It's fractional reserve central banking. Uh, and then the further collapse uh, causing the Depression of 1921. And then we've got the Roaring Twenties where it sort of goes along stable and then you get to 29 and you look at that collapse and that collapse went along with a collapse of the currency supply. I've read monetary, Milton Friedman's Monetary History of the United States from 1867 to 1963, uh, to 1960. And um, uh, during that period of the Great Depression, from uh, 29 to, I believe, 33, there was about a one-third contraction of the currency supply. 33% of the currency supply vanished. And, you know, that was when the base of the currency supply was gold that can't vanish. This is the thing about currency versus money. Uh, um, money uh, prevents uh, this collapse in the currency supply. And there isn't any reason that we, could use, we, we couldn't use it. I believe that we would be much more prosperous if we had. A lot of people think that, oh, well, with all this credit, we've had such great growth over the past hundred years. But um, what we have is 
these sprints and then we fall down you know if we we have this big contraction we would still have those with gold except uh the the um the sprints wouldn't be as big but the collapse would be much much smaller and on the whole what has created prosperity isn't credit it is uh it's innovation and uh gains in efficiencies uh and all of the stuff that we have invented uh over the past hundred years, we should be much more prosperous than we are. These booms and busts created by credit expansion and the Federal Reserve, uh, I believe, set us back. So anyway, uh, go on with the presentation. This is this is fascinating. And but you can see, I mean, in his book, uh, he talks about Webb talks about uh, <clears throat> this isn't this. The great taking isn't the first taking, uh, you know, you Look at that era where this is all falling and there was a taking that was going on then, but the, the, it sort of uh, crescendoed with the Great Depression. And there we have velocity and the currency supply collapsing in massive deflation. And when you get into deflation, the prices of all the assets fall below the debt that you owe on them. You can't sell them because you can't sell them for uh, enough to be able to pay the debt. They've, they, you're now upside down. And so the bank can take them and the bank gets to keep everything that you've paid so far on it. And, and as you know, with a loan, <clears throat> the first portion of the loan, like uh, you know, a 30 year mortgage for, the, for 15 years, you're paying mostly interest. There's very little principal that you're actually paying. And then the bank can take the property and sell it again. And even if they're selling it at a, at a slight loss from what the loan is overall, they have made a big profit. Yeah, exactly. So just, just to emphasize what's going on here, it's really a, a tale in two parts. It's this giant uh, decline in velocity here where a bunch of people and even countries lost everything. And right. then there's there's a recovery that goes from the end of World War II till about 1995, where things generally got better. Yeah. And then I want to show what happens next. So after 1995, velocity of money declines again. And it's wow. it's not just an echo of what happened before. This dropped from, oh, about 2.1 down to maybe 1.2. We, were, we started at a higher level than we were back then in 1900, and now we're at the lowest level for the velocity of money than we ever have been, ever. even lower than after the Great Depression and the right. Second World War. And, it, and we fell there even faster. So this, this first decline took about 46 years. This, this recent one, about half that, maybe 23 years. So we're falling twice as quickly as we were back then, and entire countries were wiped out. This is this is crazy. This is printing currency uh, faster than the growth of GDP. And the one thing that the Federal Reserve can only have a slight influence over and uh, can't directly control, they can directly control interest rates by creating currency and buying assets or selling the assets that they have in stock and destroying currency. Um, and that can make it can have a direct influence on interest rates almost instantly. Uh, and, uh, but velocity is, uh, largely determined by the mood of the public. It's determined by GD, GDP versus the currency supply. We've seen that, uh, now, uh, the, the bottom part of, of this thing where it just sort of falls off a cliff that coincides with the lockdowns. So GDP, um, the, the currency supply was expanded and GDP uh, collapses when nobody's allowed to go out uh, and restaurants are closed and everything else. And so <clears throat> this is um, more the public, um, uh, the, the, the market exerting influence over the economy where the Federal Reserve cannot control it. Um, but they, they do so by creating, you know, they created tons of currency uh, it's just that currency circulates less. And so you've got GDP was growing during that period, but they were creating a lot more current. They were creating currency that faster than GDP growth. Yeah, exactly. So um, I want to read one more thing from the great taking kind of addressing uh, what's been happening lately.
Hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, GoldSilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making GoldSilver.com your dealer. And now back to the video. He says, we are now living within a replay of this monetary phenomenon, i.e. a profound decline in the velocity of money, which began when velocity peaked in 1997. This was coincident with onset of a major global financial crisis known as the Asian financial crisis, and it was followed within a few years by the dot-com bubble and bust. This is my emphasis here, but it's his words. Such a collapse occurs when the economy is not growing despite very high rates of money creation. This is exactly what you just said, Mike, is exactly what we've been dealing with. Velocity of money has now contracted to a lower level than at any point during the Great Depression and World Wars. Once the ability to produce growth by printing money has been exhausted, creating more money will not help. It is pushing on a string. The phenomenon is irreversible. He's absolutely right there, except he calls currency money. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and what is happening right now is um, we're seeing a slow, the, the Fed is trying to normalize their balance sheet and they can't. We are in this period uh, where uh, uh, ever since Ben Bernanke uh, changed the way the uh, Fed works and the way the economy works back in 2008, when we've been in this emergency since 2008, which people are going to see in an upcoming video. Um, the uh, ever since he did that, um, uh, they've they've got they've had this huge balance sheet, and they're trying to normalize the balance sheet again. Every time they do this, it causes a crisis, and uh, but right now we've seen a large contraction in the currency supply. And if velocity slows and we're having this contraction, that causes eventually causes deflation. Deflation of asset prices, deflation of uh, retail prices eventually. And uh, so I believe that, you know, everything that he said in that book goes along with my roller coaster crash, that we're going to see big inflation, which we just saw, followed by a deflation, which will just scare the hell out of the Federal Reserve and the world's central banks. And they're going to print and print and print until deflation gets uh, gives way. But during that deflation, the public gets scared and they sort of pull in their horns and they stop spending. And I'm already seeing in, well, I'm not in Puerto Rico right now. Uh, I'm in uh, Utah. Uh, but um, when I was in Puerto Rico recently, I noticed that during the week, the restaurants that used to be full are now half empty uh, and uh, that there's been a big slowdown in spending. And so I believe that we are now in a recession. Uh, it's just that it won't become official for three to six months. Um, and uh, what we need to look for now is the reversions of uh, all of the inverted yield curves uh, and because that is usually when the recession starts. They, they invert before and then revert back to uh, normal and the recession starts. Uh, so I think we need to keep an eye on this velocity and on the uh, size of the currency supply because during after 1929, they were both collapsing simultaneously. That's what brought on the Great Depression. That's what trapped everybody backwards in deflation and they, uh, they in debt and they lost everything. And what he's talking about is a repeat of that on a much grander scale, because uh, the debt levels that we have now are many times what, what they had in the 1920s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I mean, thank you, Mike, for all your expertise and for being here today. Thanks for making time from Utah. Um, and okay. so th this is sort of a, uh, a nice summary of what velocity of money is and why it matters. Uh, I know that I was always taught that all these separate crises were, were indeed separate. But when I look at a chart like this, I realize that they're part of a longer systemic trend and that they are all connected, you know, 2001, 2008, 2020 and whatever comes next. 
Um, yeah. So so that's why velocity of money is so important, why, why you and I and everyone should keep an eye on it, why people should read The Great Taking. They should watch our video on it and uh, they should get ready. Yeah, I just want to ask everybody, if, if you think the, the video on The Great Taking is important, uh, you know, copy paste the URL into a, uh, a email and send it to your friends and loves, loved ones that you think need to know about this. And then uh, if you want to help us out, there was a video back at Thanksgiving uh, where a lot of people would just revisit that video the next day and let it play, even if you didn't watch it a second time. And if you can help us out by doing that with this video, or not this video, but the, the great taking video uh, that has already been released, um, uh, that would help. It gets into the Google, al the uh, YouTube algorithms, and it becomes recommended uh, viewing. And uh, so it, be, it takes on a little life of its own because right now YouTube does have us throttled. We don't seem to be able to get past uh, the, you know, they, I guess they don't like our content and uh, they uh, want to sort of suppress this knowledge. But I believe that this is really important and that people have to get ready. I'm taking steps right now because when I read his book, it's written from a little bit of a conspiracy theory uh, point of view, which is too bad because he didn't need to do that because all of these pieces have been put in place. And it, regardless of whether it's conspiracy theory or it's just the banks trying to uh, make sure that uh, uh, they are protected and it's not going to be a, uh, you know, it won't be a taxpayer bailout this time. It's going to be a depositor bailout, a uh, it's going to be taking your uh, securities, your stocks, your bonds, uh, your house, uh, all of your other assets. So it's good to not be in too much debt, probably. I, mean, I, I don't make recommendations, but personally, uh, this is what I am doing and, uh, uh, and holding physical assets. It's time for real stuff, not a bunch of paper stuff, because that paper stuff can vanish and according to the great taking and all of the laws and, and uh, um, regulations, court cases, banking regulations, they've all been changed so that they can do this. And the very fact that all those pieces are in place doesn't require a grand conspiracy. Uh, it just says that these are dangerous times and you need to know what's going on and protect yourself. Exactly. Well, Mike, I got one more question for you. Where does the Fed store their U.S. dollars? <laughs> I don't know, Alan, where? In the basement. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay. I want to thank you for this presentation, Alan. I want to remind everybody to uh, hit that thumbs up. And so like this, subscribe, and smash the notification bell. And thank you, Alan. We'll see you next time. Thanks.